and welcome back to the What The Fork podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. Today's guest is 31 times capped Scotland international and current Hibernian defender, Rachel Boyle. Welcome to the show, Rachel. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Did I get your caps right? Because I always make one mistake. I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> I really should know, but um, I'm not 100% sure. I think it was 31 and then we went to Spain, so I'm not sure if it maybe went up a wee bit. Um, I'm going to say I got it wrong because I always get one thing wrong. My research is good, but I always get one thing wrong. If you're going by, I think it's Wikipedia. If it's not been updated since we were in um, Spain, then you might be a little bit wrong. <laughs> I've learned I've learned not to trust it, put it that way. Um, <laughs> first things first, obviously you did have some time out of the game due to, to pregnancy, having a, a little one, which is fantastic. Um, but you've returned to club and international football sort of the back end of last year uh, regarding Scotland, I think November. Mm-hmm. How's the transition back to football been? Um, I think I've spoke about it before and it's probably been one of the hardest things I've ever done is getting back from, from being pregnant. Um, I've recovered from injuries and stuff before, but being out of the game for that length of time and the impact that it had on my body, it was probably the toughest recovery I've ever had to do in terms of getting my fitness back. But it's one that I'm really proud of and to be able to get back into the national team so quickly. Again, it was something that was in the back of my mind that I've, I was always wanting to try and do, um, but I never put pressure on myself to achieve that. And as I say, for it to happen so quickly and the way that it did, I'm, I'm delighted with, with how things have been going. And obviously COVID came at the wrong time for me because I was really starting to kick on. I was just literally about to ask that. Obviously, time out of the game for like the best reason in the world. Um, obviously, sure, you're buzzing to be back. So how frustrating was that COVID situation to kind of be away for like the best part of 18 months and then back and then just stop for months on end. Yeah, it's been an absolute nightmare Um, because I think going away with the national team to Spain, we we had three games to play and I kind of went knowing that I was just going to be a bit of a bit part player and and just have to take my chance when it came. But luckily for me, and I mean, I would never wish this on anyone, but a few of the girls in my position had a couple of niggly injuries when we were away. So it allowed me to uh, get more game time than what I kind of expected going over there. So um, I really took my chance and I felt I did quite well and things seemed to be going really well and I spoke to the manager at the end of the tournament and, and she was saying how pleased she was with me so yeah things were looking up and I knew that we had qualifiers around the corner I think they were due in April and I was really setting my targets on that but obviously with the whole Covid situation it's put everything on hold and, and put us all back to square one so it's just now about getting back to fitness and getting up to speed of play because I know the English girls are, are back playing contact, whereas we're not quite at that stage yet. So I'll be playing catch up. And you just came back to training sort of this week as we speak today being the 27th. Is that right? You came back to training this week, last week? Yeah, just yes, uh, just yesterday, this Sunday. Um, we started back. It's only our sessions and it's non-contact, so it's all socially distanced. Um <laughs> So, yeah, we'll see how that goes for the next few weeks and then hopefully we'll get the green light to, to get back into some contact. I've had a few sort of Hibs players on and I know a few of the guys at Hibs as well, um, sort of in the media team ever so slightly. Uh, I know how good of a club it is and how great they are. Um, really, really welcoming and lovely to people like me. So during the period when obviously you were away, how great was the club for you during that period and how supportive were they? Oh, they were incredible. Um, yeah, I can't. I don't have a bad word to say about Hibs at all. They're they're such a family club, and and they knew to that when I was out of the game that I was obviously desperate to be playing with the girls. But at the same time, um, family came first for me, so they were really supportive. And any time that I was along, even if I was just joining and training, doing non-contact stuff with the girls, just to kind of keep knitted in with them, it was it was really good. And I can't, as I say, I can't have a bad word to say about anyone, um, coaching staff, right down to the players to to backroom staff, um, yeah, they're a first-class club and I would definitely, definitely push their name out there and, and say that they're probably one of the best clubs that I've been a part of. Absolutely. I think um, it was no real surprise to me that at the time I was speaking to, I think, Head of Communications, Kenny, um, at the same time, a few weeks, a few days later, I think the NHS sponsorship came out and things like that. And I think um, it probably goes quite under the radar how good of a club hubs, uh, hips are in terms of community aspects, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think off the pitch, their their community base is massive. Um, our team's obviously based under the Community Foundation, yeah. uh, which is the, the charitable arm of, of Hibernia. And, and the work that they do in the community, both for underprivileged kids, for the elderly, it's every, everyone together. And I think that really branches out across the whole of Leith and, and East Lothian area and stuff. It's, it's huge. Um, and it's something that 
any chance we've been given the opportunity to join in and help out as best we can. I think most of the girls, if not all of us, have, have jumped at the chance. For people who don't know, I, I kind of heard that that obviously you're under coming to the community side of things, um, which I actually wasn't fully aware of. I thought it was kind of completely 100% aligned because it is so close, obviously, on the front of the programme. Um, the club itself, I think you can research anything like Hibernian women on the Hibs website that is predominantly previously probably the men only. So how does that work in terms of you being the community side and um, Hibs being like, I suppose, the, the Hibs men being the club club? What, what are the differences and what are the similarities? I think it was more just so that the women's team was based solely as the women's team. Um, we obviously had the support of the men. We got the kits, we got the training facilities, we've got everything that we need there. But at the same time, we were our completely separate team. We were taking no funds from the men's team. I think that was a big thing at the time. I think when, when Hibs were struggling, the men's fans and um, predominantly male supporters were saying that they didn't want any of their funds for the first team going towards the women's teams, which is maybe a bit backwards now. But I can totally understand the fact that the men are bringing in all the revenue and right now women football is not that big in terms of the financial support that we have. So yeah, we were completely cut off from them in terms of just working on our own and I think we've been really successful and I think that's why the, the men's club have started to bring us under their, their arm and, and just allow us to be a part of the club and, and share our successes with them um, because we have been doing really well in terms of winning trophies and winning cups it's been only but positive for, for Hibernian as a whole. So yeah, it's been it's been good to be a part of this club and it's something going forward that we're looking to develop and um, yeah, hopefully the connection will only get stronger. As anyone knows, listen to the, the podcast, we do like to delve back into sort of your, your history as far back as we can go or as far back as you'll allow us to go. Um, born in Aberdeen, 1991. So what are your earliest footballing memories? Um, I think when I was about three or four I think it was um my dad started to run my older brother's football team uh, my brother was about six uh, so he was at the age of where he was ready to start joining football teams and playing so so my dad got involved and he started running my brother's team and um my mum worked at weekends so I had to either go and be with my grandparents or go with my dad to my brother's football so so I went with my dad and my brother and I was just kind of playing at the side and I ended up just getting a hold of a ball and, and just joining in a wee bit and I kind of just got involved with all the older boys and they were really good with me, they allowed me to play and from that I just kind of grew and I was always playing with my brother out in the back garden at the park with him and all his friends so so from a young age it's always been me and my brother and then yeah I eventually got to the age where I had to kind of go and do my own thing and, and join my own team and it was from that point I really started to love football and it was something I wanted to continue. And you played with the, the boys team till you were about what 14-15 and then I think if I, if I heard this correctly you were told you no longer could and that was a bit of a, a shock to the system because you didn't see the difference and football's football right? Yeah ah, to me at that age I didn't know any different. Um, football was football to me and to be told that I wasn't allowed to play with my friends who I've grown up with for all these years. And as I say, they were my best friends. I didn't really have many girlfriends um, growing up through school. It was always the boys. Every break time, every lunchtime, I was out playing in the in the playground with the boys, playing football. So, so for me to be told that I wasn't allowed to play with my best friends anymore, it was a bit gut-wrenching. Um, and I really didn't know what to do. I had never really heard much about women's football. Something, maybe it was me being blindsided. I never really paid much attention to it. Um, so I wasn't really fully aware of the opportunities that women's football had at the time. So for me to then be told that I had to go and source a, a girls team and luckily for me Aberdeen ladies, um, the under 17s team at the time were interested and mainly they'd heard a bit about me so so I went along to their training and I joined in and I met a few of the girls who to this day are, are still my best friends right now so um, yeah that was probably the best move for me in terms of the next step from progression from boys into the, the girls side. It's funny when you sort of have I've had Beth uh, Mead on the show, I've had Rachel Furness on the show, and now yourself as well. And the the stories are really similar to how you came into football. It's like boys team till you were 14, and then it's like girls team 15, 16, 17. And it's funny because obviously working for, for Middlesbrough, I see like an under eight team and under 14s and under 16s and under 18s and under a reserve team and then your first team as well. Um, I think there is still quite a while to go. Uh, I think there's still a way to go with what we could do with women's football but the pathway for girls nowadays seems a little bit more maybe structured 
um, than maybe it was, say, 10, 15, 20 or whatever many years ago it would be. Uh, but what were the opportunities like for you as a youngster? And I mean, before you went to Aberdeen, getting into playing with girls, was it ever there? Was it ever that opportunity or was it always the boys team? And then at a certain point, you went straight into almost like a first team. Um, yeah, no, for me, like, I think it's night and day now from like when I was growing up to girls now, as you say, the, the pathway's there for the young girls. But for me, it was always pretty much full on boys right the way up. Um, it wasn't until I went to the academy and I had a, a guidance teacher there who was also the football manager. Um, so I was playing under him, but he was also my guidance teacher. And he actually pulled me in one day and said, look, there's, there's a Scottish schools, girls trials coming up. And I really think you'd be be good for it so he kind of got me involved in the whole international setup if you if you say so um so Scottish schools came about I went for trials didn't know anyone because obviously I wasn't playing in the in the girls leagues at that point and um, so I went and got involved and from there it kind of really kicked on and I eventually had, as I say I had to stop playing with the boys and that's when I started to get to know more and more girls and and it just kind of grew and grew from there so yeah I would say if I didn't have that guidance teacher the the coach at the time um who really dug in deep into women's football and, and figured out the opportunities that were there for me there's no chance I would have got to where I was today because he really set the ball in motion and what are the differences at that level between men and women's football is there any or is it the same game or do you have to adjust certain things or does it just feel the same I think growing up it was it always felt the same and um, I always felt like I was just as good as the boys um, and yeah. There was always that added extra pressure of wanting to beat them because they you would maybe see them laughing at the fact that they had a girl in their team or whatever. So, yeah, it was always the same for me. Never really noticed much of a difference. It was only when you started to get a little bit older, maybe as I was hitting about the 14, 15 age, that you started to see them physically develop a hell of a lot quicker than what I was. They were physically stronger, quicker, um, able to kick the ball further, harder. It was just these tactical or technical things that I couldn't keep up with and it was nothing that I could have done to change that it was just like with my control just the simple fact that I was female and they were male so um yeah really started to notice at about that age that maybe they were jumping too far ahead of me um and it was time for me to to go into a female environment and, and push myself against other top class female players and you were more or less straight into the international fold when you were at Aberdeen weren't you was it the under 17s that you captained um, under 19s, I captained. Um, yeah, Shelley was the manager at that point for the under 19s, and she made me captain when I got to there. Um, so yeah, I was straight in. I went right through the youth development. I went through 15s, 17s, 19s, and then into the A squad, which for me was a great experience. The youth squads, I think anyone you speak to will say the youth squads are probably the best time of your of your life. Um, you're playing with your friends, you're traveling the world, you're you're loving life, just getting to play football. So. Yeah, those were great years and great memories. Obviously, schooling had to take a back seat sometimes, but um, my parents were really understanding and they knew that I wanted to go and, and push myself as far as I could with football and, and see what I could achieve. Do you know, at a youth level, um, and this is across the board in every aspect of the game, I've always found that a lot of, I can't pinpoint any clubs in that and I won't, but a lot of clubs focus on winning the game and it's all about winning at any cost. When you were growing up, did you kind of feel like you had a little bit less pressure, more opportunity to enjoy yourself in Scotland and kind of just get used to playing the game? Even if you maybe narrowly lost, it was about experience and about kind of what you could add to. Did you feel it was a little bit, not less competitive, but more about the learning phase as opposed to just winning at all costs? Yeah, I mean, I think for me growing up in Aberdeen, we were never the top team in the league in Scotland. Um, so there was that pressure was completely taken away. We were never expected to win the league year on year out, like what maybe Glasgow City were. Mm -hmm. um, so that pressure for me was not there. Um, I don't know if I would have thrived a bit better if I was in that sort of environment. But for me, it was all about learning the game and, and trying to get up to that level of women's football because I was really young when I started um, in the Premier League with the, the women. Um, so I was, I was really little, really weak. So all of these things kind of played a factor in me progressing as a player. I had to kind of get up to that that standard um, to be able to compete with the girls down south who were playing at the top of their game and internationals. Um, so yeah, I, I really pushed myself as hard as I could for Aberdeen and I think we started to progress quite well um, and we even sometimes achieved more than what we probably should have as a, as a club. Um, but we've always said 
for the size of the Aberdeen city and the whole North region, uh, we should have had better amount of players coming through at the time. We, we only had a small number of players coming through to the women's team at the time. And for the size of the region, it just wasn't good enough. So I think they've done a lot of work up there to try and develop the women's game up there and, and give that pathway, as you say, for, for young girls coming through now. With um, Aberdeen, you growing up, obviously born in Aberdeen, were you an Aberdeen fan then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have any yeah. favourites like growing up that you'd look up to? Um, I think at the time everybody kind of looked at Russell Anderson. He was the, the Aberdeen legend and because he played in defence, um, that was somebody that I always looked to to see how he played the game and stuff. Um, but at the same time, everybody loves a goal scorer and things like that. So, uh, yeah, there was a few different players, but I would say I more looked towards um, the Man United team because I grew up supporting Man United and I was I had access to them to watch them on the TV and stuff probably more so than the amount of times I managed to get to Pataudry just for the pure yeah. simple fact that either we were playing at weekends or it was too expensive to go to Pataudry at the time so um, yeah I always looked up to, to Man United players and, and the, the golden generation um, 1919 and stuff like that so those were the players that I kind of looked to for inspiration. You really threw me back with Russell Anderson there because obviously Sunderland signed him. Um, and I think he played one game and it just never really worked out from here. And I'm thinking, <laughs> God, that's really going back. Jeez. Yeah, he's, um, he's not a Sunderland legend, that's for sure. <laughs> no, he didn't. It didn't really work out, but I'm sure he's a lovely man. I'm sure he's a lovely man. Um, in terms of the international level we were talking about before, obviously you made your Scotland debut against Poland in 2010. Now, I hope my research has been good with this and I'm pretty certain it has. But I'm sure it was Kim Little that scored twice and you won 2-1. Couldn't tell you who scored the goals. I'm assuming it was. <laughs> I'm assuming it was Kim because she used to pop up with a goal all the time. So yeah, probably was right with that. Um, but yeah, we won two one. I got. I think it was maybe the last twenty minutes or something. Um, but all the all the top players were playing. There was Pauline Hamill. There was Joe Love, Gemma Faye, like all these great players. Rhonda Jones. It was something that I'd aspired to do. Um, maybe not from when I was. A young young girl but as I started to get through the youth levels I always knew that I wanted to to reach the top and, and play for the national team so to be able to do it so soon after coming out of the under 19 setup um yeah it was a proud moment for me and it was something that I'll always remember. Was Gemma someone that you looked up to because she's from Aberdeen as well isn't she? Um, yeah as far as I'm aware um don't really know Gemma's background that well <laughs> um but yeah she was she was the captain she was the, one of the most capped players at the time and she was always someone that you could go to and speak to. And, then, yeah. and playing in defence, having her behind you, she, she never shuts up. So you knew that you were in, in good hands with her. She was always trying to keep you in the right position. And she talked you through the whole game, which was really good for a young player coming through. Um, so, yeah, Gemma was top class for me uh, when I first broke into the team. With uh, the game itself, obviously, you mentioned Kim Little. I think scored twice. I could be completely wrong, but I'm sure I'm sure Google's served me well here. Um, mm -hmm. She's a player right at the top of the game, sort of now, and obviously was fantastic then as well. But how much do you enjoy playing with her at the international level, and, and what does she bring to sort of the Scottish national team for you as a, as a player? Oh, she's incredible. Um, I think worldwide people are starting to know who Kim yeah. Little is, and they've known her for years now. She's she's an unbelievable player, and and not only that, she's a very humble person. Um, I think when I first joined the national team, I actually shared a room with Kim. And to just go about and see how she goes about her business and conducts herself off the pitch as well as on it. She was an incredible person to be um, to share the pitch with and obviously be off the pitch with. She was a top, top teammate. And yeah, it's somebody that I've always looked up to and, and just the way, as I say, she conducts herself. Um, great person, great player. And you know that if you're, if you're never stuck on the pitch, you can just give her the ball and, and she'll sort it out for you. Um, she's just unbelievable. How important is it for a player, and I know obviously you'll be someone that will be handing advice on as well now um, with your experience you've had, but how important was it for you growing up to have someone like Kim Little who would kind of maybe been there, done that, done all that stuff that was so easy to speak to and you know, experience or advice was all there for you to kind of lean on as you were coming through the sort of ranks? Yeah, I mean, I think what I take away from sharing a room with Kim was she never, off the pitch, she was never really speaking much about football. Um, on her downtime was her downtime. She never really focused on the fact that she had played at the Olympics, she had played um, here, there and everywhere. It was all very much just chill, just take your mind off football. So, yeah, for me, that was that was great because I knew that 
to be at the top of your game, you still had to be able to switch off and not have to worry about it 24-7. So to see her just completely relaxed away from the game and, and then as it started to ramp up to game time, that's when you've seen her start to focus and stuff. So, so yeah, she was a great player to learn from and it's hopefully someone that I can um, aspire to be as good as one day. But I think time's running out for me there. So With... Um your household itself so you're talking about switching off and having that downtime how hard is it to switch off in the Boyle household because let's be honest it's pretty dominated by either probably a little one or probably football or probably Hibs yeah I think um people have said to me during lockdown like how have you coped because you're normally full on um but for us it's actually been quite good we've we've had a set routine with the wee one so we know that like the morning is like full on with her and then once she goes for a nap we kind of get an hour and a bit to ourselves so Martin will disappear and play his Xbox, which gives me an hour to myself to just kind of chill out, whether it was doing the gym or whether it was just sitting watching Netflix or something. It was just our own time. And then obviously she got back up and, and caused the absolute carnage again. So um, mm -hmm. we just had her to deal with until maybe seven, half past seven at night when it was ready for her bed. And then we got the evenings to ourselves. So um, yeah, lockdown was quite good in terms of being able to just relax a wee bit, knowing when we could and when we couldn't. But um, most of the time, it's very, very chill. We don't really speak that much about football when we're not at football. Yeah. If you know what I mean, we, we like to keep it, keep it separate and family time's family time for us. Absolutely. Um, you had three years, I think, or three seasons. At, I always pronounce this wrong, but four, four. Um, yeah. How was your experience there? It was great. I loved it. absolutely loved my time at four, four. Um that was the first time I'd actually branched out in football and, and went somewhere completely new that I didn't really know anyone. Um, but I felt at the time I had to go and do it to kind of progress my football um, and it was one of the best moves I made uh, the girls there were, were really welcoming and it was a really close-knit club kind of like Hibs where everybody looked after each other um, and yeah again similar to Aberdeen we kind of we almost became better than what we should have been. Um, I think we finished second one year, which nobody expected us to do. And we reached the Scottish Cup final and ran Glasgow City quite close that day. Um, so yeah, that was an incredible season for us. And it was one that I think really set set in light how good Forfar could potentially be with, with the right players, the right staff. And at that point in time, we were we were hitting the heights of what we, this club could be. Um, could achieve really uh, so yeah that was a great time but then obviously all good things come to an end and it was time for me to move back on again. Talking about um, you know the move being outside of Aberdeen I know it's only about an hour away or so but it is moving to a new club where you don't mm -hmm. know people it's the first club that's not your hometown club I think I speak to a lot of people who sometimes go on loan when they're like 16, 17, 18 and they spend that year away from home you obviously took a big leap by moving there permanently and spending sort of three years there how important is that to a professional footballer going to a different club in a different city where you know someone, not just then, but like later on in life, like now, how much did that experience help the way you play it and the way you view the game now? Yeah, I think it allows you to adapt both as a player and as a person. You, you need to come out of your comfort zone to, to really challenge yourself. And I think at that time I was getting pretty comfortable at Aberdeen. I'd been there for a few years and I knew that I was going to play every week. Um, so for me, that was... The comfortable stage and I needed to break out of that mould and going to Forfar was a completely new set of players, completely new set of staff that I had to try and impress um, so you were bringing your A-game every session. Um, obviously it was it was different for me, I was travelling in the car maybe an hour each way um, to train so it was it was quite difficult in terms of that because you know what like when you've been sitting in the car for that long and you're stiff and you need to get out and try and run about so I had to kind of overcome that and, and really set my life into balance because at the time, the first few weeks, I don't think I was eating properly. I was just buying stuff at the garage, just eating it in the car on the way to training and stuff. So so that was a whole learning curve for me. Um, but yeah, moving forward, it allowed me to develop in terms of playing different styles of play, playing with different players and adapting to how different situations come about in the pitch. Um, obviously, Forfar were a completely different team from Aberdeen. So, so there was different mindsets, different personalities and different ways of playing with the coaches. So... So yeah, it was a it was a great learning curve for me, and it was something that I'll look back on, and I'll never ever regret, regret that decision to to leave Aberdeen and go there because it was something that I needed to do. As it was, like you said, you know, you moved on towards Hibernian, where you still are at the moment. 
I think around 2017, 18, 19, obviously you had a little bit of time away because of um, giving birth. But I think 2017 was kind of where you really came to form, played the most amount of games you had done for Scotland. But then, lo and behold, obviously you missed the World Cup for the best reason on the planet. But at the same time, you know, you did miss it. And I can understand that is frustrating. But did you get a chance to go over and see the girls in France? No, I was um, getting ready to get married. <laughs> oh, so you were. Um, yes, of yeah. course. So, um, yeah, I had had my wedding booked um, way before I even got back involved with the national team um, and before we obviously fell pregnant. So um, the wedding day was booked and I think we played the day after Scotland played. We got married the day after Scotland played Japan. Um, so I can remember just sitting at my mum's the day before my wedding. I was in my mum's house in Aberdeen and I was trying to sort out like all the, the wedding parts. I was putting them in different bags and getting them all packed up and ready to take them over at the venue. In the meantime, I'm sitting trying to watch Scotland versus Japan and my mum's shouting at me saying, you've got to get this done. I said, well, just give me a minute. <laughs> There's a goal went in here. <laughs> like, so, um, yeah, that was a, a stressful time. I never actually got to go over and, and watch the girls, but I watched every game on the TV and, yeah, absolutely loved seeing them there, but a little bit of jealousy at the same time. <laughs> absolutely. No, no, absolutely. I think... Um... Obviously, like I was saying before, it's the best reason. If you're going to miss a World Cup, that's the best reason yeah. to miss it, let's be honest. Um, and I'm absolutely 100% certain there's not even a 0.0.1% of regret with that. But it is difficult. You know, you've you probably wanted and dreamt to go to a major tournament with your country for a long time. And I think we've got to be honest and say that 2020 was probably the big moment where actually household names started being made, not just in America, like across in here as well, Scotland, England, wherever it would, may be. So at what point do you kind of, become at peace with it that you're not going to go it's fine and become just that fan that's like screaming at the tv which I imagine you were against Argentina but um. I think um I think the minute I fell pregnant was the time where I realized right I'm not going to go to this World Cup it's just not going to happen um and for me I was at peace with it like straight away I remember sitting I was due to give birth on the Thursday in September and I think the national team were playing in Albania on the Tuesday a couple of days before and I was sitting watching them on BBC Alba and it was that day that they qualified and I remember sitting um, around at my friend's house and we're having dinner and I was thinking to myself I could have been there but at the same time I knew that in two days time I was welcoming this little girl in our lives and it was something that I would never ever trade and to this day I would never trade it again um, if somebody asked me if I could time it all better no, no, I couldn't because the way she's turned out is just absolutely perfect and it was obviously meant to be for me. So, yeah, hopefully in the future I'll be able to... Talking about the, what we said before with the World Cup, I think 2016 in Canada gave that a real big push, a push sorry, in promotion and media for the women's side of the game. But, yeah, 2020, the World Cup made sort of household names. I mean, it's you regularly hear Rapino and Alex Morgan, but at the same time you've got... Erin Cuthbert, Beth Mead, Ellen White, people know who they are, how they play, what they do, Kim Little, you know, there's tons of names like that. So as someone who's been involved with the game for, you know, the best part of a decade, um, and, well, your whole life, really, um, how far do you think the past two World Cups, and in specific the last one, has taken the women's game? Oh, it's absolutely massive. Um, I think even the Euros, I think... England's got a huge part to play in that because obviously they've been competing at the top for, for many years now. Um, they're on par with the Americans and, and yeah, they're a top, top team. And now that Scotland are starting to progress regularly for these tournaments, um, I think that's only enhancing the whole women's football in, in Britain. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that can continue. Um, Scotland are doing really well in qualifying at the moment. So we're looking at getting to, to the Euros um, down in England. So that, again, would can only boost women's football in this country and, and also across the board in Britain. Um, but obviously, as you say, the Americans are, are huge in terms of broadcasting women's football and, and getting household names out there because I think they're seen as equals to the, their male counterparts in the US, if not bigger. Um, yeah. I regularly hear Alex Morgan more than I hear any of the, the men's national team. Um, I think such down in England now is starting to become a household name in America as well now so yeah it's it's huge it's getting bigger but as you say there's still a long long way to go for women's football to to get it up to the level and, and be equals with the men 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what I was going to ask. We've come so, so far, but there's definitely, as someone who works within women's football, at a, I suppose, not the high level, but still works within it, I can see where the differences are and what needs to be changed. But what do you think needs to be done better to make sure we continue to progress? I don't know. I think the standard needs to continually improve. Um, yeah. We can never let standards drop. I think people will be more interested if it's more competitive. So instead of having one team, I think for many years in Scotland, it's been Glasgow City at the top. Um, but recently, Hibs have started to challenge them in both Cups and League. Um, but now that we're starting to get more investment in the Scottish League, we've got Celtic and Rangers who are, who are really investing in their women's teams. And that can only be good for the Scottish game. And hopefully it'll make the whole league more competitive, which will in turn bring in more fans because I think until we start getting more spectators into the game we're not really going to build a revenue and, and build the financial side of things so until we get some support in that sense we can't really then broadcast any further than beyond our own country so we really need to work on the domestic game at the moment and then hopefully with the success of the national team tied in with the domestic game we can really start to branch out and, and make it as big as we possibly can because as you say you, you can see it in England it's it's huge down in WSL now the investment that they get and and the crowds that they get to some of their games is massive so so yeah we're as a nation trying to, to push up to that level and, and really grow the game. How underappreciated do you think the fact that you know you always have that argument of women's football men's football standards and things like that but I, you know like I say, someone who sees girls train twice a week and then have to go to their work and do their job and then you know, work in retail or go to university or do whatever it is that they may do. I think people forget that for the best part of 50 years in Britain, football wasn't really allowed. So you've lost 50 years of progression there where you also got men who train five days a week, um, the nutritionist, strength and condition, all that kind of stuff. We've just got a strength and conditioning coach in the past six months, and it's just amazing to have one. It's like, wow, look, we're, like we have yeah. one. But how underappreciated do you think it is that like a lot of women who play football need to also work? You included, I think. Yeah, um, I work part time. Um, I worked full time before I had my daughter, but I've obviously since then I, I went part time. But there's still a lot of girls in the game that are working full time and training. Um, it's hard. It really is, and yeah, you can't really progress the game any further unless you're you're really putting in the time and effort and I'll always remember like my husband will come home from his training and he'll just completely relax whereas I'm working I'll come home I'll make tea and then I'm like right see you later I'm away training so it's like a full day for me whereas he's home by middle of the afternoon and that's him done his work and his training all in one which is frustrating because yeah. I wish that was me sometimes but um yeah there's there's a long way to go as you say and, and until we can get the investment in the game and allow these girls to go full time and, and make it a career in this country then we're going to have a lot of talented players move on from the country and until we can provide that support for them yeah absolutely um going back to international um ambitions i suppose we've got the euros coming up how important well stupid question here but i'm going to ask it nonetheless but how important is going to a major competition for you individually um, I mean, it would be a dream come true. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm, I'm going to be there because uh, one, we need to qualify and two, I need to make that squad. I need to be good enough for the manager to pick me. So, so yeah, it's going to be a dream to get there. Um, I think we're doing really well in qualifying at the moment. We've got top, top players in our team. Um, and as a squad, we're just progressing each game. So, yeah, we're confident that we could be there. Um, we're hoping to, to get the games up and running again so we can carry on the form that we've had. Um, but for me personally, I would love to be there, but life gets in the way sometimes. So we'll just have to wait and see how things go for me between now and then and, and if I'm hitting the form that I need to be for, for the manager to select me for that if and when we get there. So. Talking about international level, obviously I've looked at the, the teams you've played against, the players you came up against as well, and there's been some great players. But personally, who's the toughest opponent that you've ever faced? Um, I would say probably I played against Abby Wambach um, over in America Yeah. and just for the simple fact that she is massive <laughs> like her size and stature was just huge and, and then you get me at 5 foot 2 like I couldn't compete <laughs> with her like I couldn't move her I was standing behind her and she was shielding the ball from me and I could put my whole my force in her and she would not budge so, so for that sense 
she was probably one of the most difficult. Um, but at the same time, to play against like Les Sommer for France, um, who is absolutely rapid and, and really yeah. tricky at her feet and stuff, these type of players I've came up against and I've found it really difficult because you just don't know which way she's going to go. You can try and force her one way, but she'll always find a way to cut back inside you and things. So, so yeah, really difficult players, but the list is endless. Like you yeah. could go on and on with the talented players that you've came up against. So, Talking about, I think we mentioned it a little bit before, um, when you spent time out of the game and then came back, I can't remember which game it was. I get the feeling it was St. Mirren, but you were on the front of the Hibs programme, which of course was like, I think you were the first female on the front of a, a Hibs program of all time. Um, you also came back and won a trophy, all that kind of stuff. But how important was moments like that for you after the time you spent away to be on the front of a program to kind of be seen as almost like a role model um, to like younger girls coming up? Be like, look, Rachel's done it. You can do it. Like you can have that kind of life. You can be a footballer. You can you can have a baby and you can come back. Like how important was it for you to? Be that person that showed, you know, maybe younger girls or girls coming through, you, you know, you can still do the things that you dream of and be a footballer. Yeah, I mean, for being on the programme, I think it was International Women's Day, which I think was the whole idea of putting a woman on the front of the programme. Um, yeah. So at the time, I didn't actually realise that no other female had been had been on the front of the programme. And, and for me, we kind of had a running joke that um, it was me instead of our captain, Joelle Murray, who's been at Hibs from when she was really young so yeah for her not to be selected and I was it was a it was a running joke for her but yeah I mean looking back you're you've got all these little girls you're standing outside the stadium and, and I do go regularly for to watch my husband on a Saturday so I'll turn up on a Saturday afternoon and I'll have my little girl with me and things and you do get some girls coming up to you with their parents asking for a photo and stuff and it does take you aback because to me I'm not there as a Hibs ladies player I'm there to support my husband um, and then it's vice versa. If he comes to watch me on a Sunday, he'll get little kids coming up to him asking for photos. And he always has to kind of put a hat on in case he gets bothered or whatever and people don't recognise him. But but no, we love it. The fact that girls are now coming up to me and sometimes there's even been boys, which is great to see because normally yeah. it's predominantly boys that will go to boys and men and stuff. And it's the little girls that will come up to the women. But no, there has been some little boys that are coming along our games and, and they want photos and that as well, which is pleasing to see. So hopefully that mindset will, will change and the male, the male side of things growing up and, and they'll look to women's football and not just see it as, oh, that's just a girl playing football. So, yeah. It is one of those things. It's like the games are now on the TV as well. You've actually got like the She Believes Cup. Like I remember, you know, I was in bed with my girlfriend. I was like, oh, the England game kicks off at like one or something like that. And we stood up and watched it, but like it was advertised. You could, you knew it was going to be on the TV. You knew what was coming. You knew the players that were in it. I think sometimes just, especially for younger kids, like when I was younger, it was never on TV to my, to my knowledge, to my memory. Whereas now you can watch WSL games. You've got the internet. You've got the international games are always on. World Cups are highly publicised. Um, can you feel like that audience from maybe watching um, via different mediums and media and stuff like that? Is it booming inside the actual grounds for you now? Are you noticing like the extra hundreds and two hundreds just coming on season on season? I mean, I think in the Scottish domestic game, there's there's not that much growth in terms of fans in the crowd. Um, as I say, we have only played one game this season before yeah. COVID. Um, so that was a bit of a, a kick in the teeth because we felt that this season was probably going to be the biggest domestically in the Scottish game so we were really looking forward to trying attracting more fans and stuff so to have only one game and then for it all to kind of fall flat it, it's been disappointing but hopefully we can kind of kick on and pick up where we left off but yeah as you say to see games coming on TV and you know exactly when they're going to be on people actually look forward to it and it's a simple fact that if nothing else is on, you'll just click it on to see what's happening, whether you know people or not. And um, yeah, to, to see the She Believes Cup, it's huge. And then we obviously have games on BBC Alba being broadcast across our league. And, and it's not always the top team. It's not always Glasgow City. It's not always Hibs, which is pleasing to see because you can then relate to, to other teams. And I think girls growing up, if they're not the best, they can still look and be like, well, I could still achieve that because... The team at the bottom of the league still getting shown on TV sort of thing so so yeah there's um the broadcast is there and the media is there we just need to kind of build on it and, and improve as we go but that can only help with as I say getting more fans in the game and more spectators and, and obviously the national team continuing to do well because they play a huge part 
Absolutely. Um, with Hibs, you mentioned it before, you've only played one game. Um, obviously, the, the season for people who don't know aligns slightly differently um, to the, the, the men's side of things. So you play one game and COVID happens, but you're playing under a new coach. I know that because of COVID, you've probably spent far too, I think, been apart for far too long. But from what you've experienced in him so far, how have you enjoyed working under him? Yeah, he's been great. He's been a breath of fresh air. Um, we've since I've moved to Hibs, there's been a few different managers, so I've had yeah. to adapt um, across my time here. Um, luckily for me, um, everyone's seen something in me that they like. So, so yeah, hopefully that'll be the same with the new manager. I think over pre-season, I've kind of gained the respect of being one of the older players in the squad, and he's kind of turned to me a wee bit in, in terms of speaking about maybe younger players in the team and, and seeing how we can improve them and and kind of bring them out their shell a wee bit. So, yeah, I've kind of been left to kind of bring the team together and, and keep everyone close-knit. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back to training and meeting new players and, and seeing all the, the old faces again and kind of kick on and see how we get on. But, as I say, the manager's been great. He's been he's been trying really hard and obviously he's been put on furlough, which means we've not really heard from him that much over COVID. Um but the backroom staff who, who haven't been put on furlough, they've been really good and they've kept in touch. So hopefully we go back with a good base of fitness and we can just kick on. And the good thing is, yeah, you mentioned before about new players coming in and one of the players that you signed, we spoke about off air, is someone I've known for quite a while now, Charlotte Potts. Tremendous character, tremendous player. If I, I've got to be honest, she is a great addition. I can assure you with that. Um, but we also spoke about it before, touching it before with Rangers and Celtic and the investment they've put in there in Glasgow City. They have kind of dominated or been seen as the dominant force, the, the Man United of the Liverpool, if you prefer, um, of Scotland. How confident are you of challenging against those clubs this year? Because obviously you've got yourselves, Rangers, Celtic, and now Glasgow City is probably the top four. And it's really competitive with the way that Rangers and Celtic have been investing. You've brought new players in. Glasgow City, you've got the stable. So how confident are you of challenging for the title again this year? I mean, we're not going to come out and say we're going to win it because we haven't won it yet in previous years when we've been at our strongest. Um, yeah. Continually, year on year, we've lost players. We've always had to kind of readapt and bring new faces in to try and supplement the team. And I think it's getting harder and harder because, as you say, teams are now go professional, so players would yeah. rather go elsewhere. Um, so for us, it's about maintaining a level of standards that we've we've set over the past few seasons and, and bringing, as you say, the new faces that come in, we need to get them up to the standard of the club and, and make sure that they're going to hit the ground running. Um, we obviously played against Spartans at the start of the, the year and it was a really close game. I think we only beat them 1-0 with the last kick of the game, really. So um, teams are developing all the time and we can't sit here and say we're going to be the best because we know that it's going to be difficult. Um, obviously all teams have strengthened across the board and I would say maybe we've weakened we haven't really got the strength and depth that we've had in previous years so maybe a couple of injuries here or there could really affect us as a squad so so for us it's about sticking together and, and really pushing on and we know that every game is going to be a challenge so we just need to perform to our best and, and see what we can get out of this season but there's no denying Hibs as a club are known for winning trophies so we need to be to be challenging. Absolutely. Um, final question then. It's a, a, a packed question that I'm sure could have a million different answers, but in the immediate future, what, what is your future? What is what you're looking to go into? How are you looking to the next few years? What's, what's your hopes? Um, I think just now we need to focus on getting back to, to match fitness and match sharpness. Obviously, it's been a long, long time since we've been kicking a ball about. So so I need to focus on that and get back into training with the, the girls and, and see how I get on. But as far as I'm aware, there's international games coming up in September, October. Um, and that's something that I would love to be a part of. I um, absolutely love being away with the girls in, in March there in Spain. So so to get back involved with that, going into competitive qualifiers is something that I'm really aspiring to do. And as you say, over the next few years, we're, we're looking at kicking on as a club and both domestically and internationally, I, I really want to try and push and qualify for the Euros and, and see where that takes us. Fantastic. Rachel, thanks very much. Um, Thank you. Look after Charlotte for me. Um, <laughs> and I hope you have a, a fantastic year and hopefully we we'll get back playing football soon, eh? Yeah, fingers crossed. Awesome. Thanks very much. No problem, Rachel. Thank you. Okay.